Welcome to BizTech Forward, your go-to podcast for cutting-edge insights at the intersection of business and technology. Join us as we explore the trends, innovations, and strategies shaping the future of the digital world. Let's move forward together. Welcome to the new episode of BizTech Forward, the podcast where we delve into the world of technology and business with some of the brightest minds at daytime. I am Ani from the Media Relations team, and I get to work with these brightest minds every day. So think of me as your friendly tour guide as we discuss the past, present, and future in tech. Today, we are going into a hot, hot topic, data quality in AI. We'll be answering the big question, what is it that makes data good for AI? And how can bad data totally mess things up? And to help us unpack all of this, we are joined by Yuri Gubin, Chief Innovation Officer at Datart. Welcome, Yuri. Hey, hi, Annie. Just a brief intro. Yuri, like I said, uh, is the Chief Innovation Officer at Datart, and he helps clients solve complex technology problems and rebuild their businesses, actually. He also leads many labs at Datart, like AI, DevOps, Cloud, Solution Architect Board, and many partnerships. Uh, Yuri is a technologist, he's a mentor, among many other things. So it's such a pleasure to have you with us. Yeah, thank you, Ani. And I think that you're you're absolutely right. The, the data quality in AI, um, what it entails, where the thing things are going, what are the expectations, and what are the pitfalls. I think this is something that everybody needs to be concerned right now and moving in 2025. Right. And before we dive in, just a quick note: we usually break the show into three fun parts. Uh, past, present, and future, and we always sneak in a little unpopular opinion from our guests, so do not miss that. Uh, on that note, let's get right to it. Uh, Yuri, the past, how did we get here? So let's start by going back in time a little bit. Data is surely essential for the success of any artificial intelligence project. Data and AI have been linked forever. But was data quality always the top priority? Was it always such a big deal? So basically, what was it like in the early days? Yeah, so um, data quality, yeah, don't get me wrong, data quality was and is and will be the paramount in data management. And uh, it is crucial to have good data to make decisions, to you know think about what, what are the trajectories and trends to, to drive the business and strategy. But the thing that changed is that the the, con the the context that we are talking about this um, about uh, data quality it's AI, and in the past the trajectory was that companies grow this AI capability and it depends on a very strong data foundation. You naturally grow into advanced analytics, machine learning, by doing the data right. So. But what changed in the last 18, 24 months is that AI is now very, very accessible. It is very powerful. It is generative. It, it can handle natural language, structured. It can handle everything. And it is right there. There is an API. There is an interface. And you can start building your AI applications. So even without the strong data foundation, everybody jumped into AI and adoption of AI. And now what changed really is you see the implications of poor data quality for your products, for your applications. And the setting where we are right now is that we really talk about poor data quality and how it affects AI when really we should not have this conversation because it's so essential to have the data right, the infrastructure, the, the ownership of the data and many other things to do the AI in the right way. To be more precise and specific, um, with gen with Gen AI with AI models in, in general, um, garbage in, garbage out. Whatever data you feed it, it will generate insights, or it will advise on decisions, or it will generate text based on what you give. It. And overfitted models, biases in decisions, um, hallucinations, poor quality and accuracy of responses all of it stems from either your data or data that was used to train the original model. Right. And when we talk about biases in AI, 
we need to talk about biases in data that we have, that we have accumulated, that are the, the data that was used to train that model. So it's, it's, it's much more complex than just, you know, point to say data quality or, or missing fields or duplicates or, um, you know, incompleteness of the data and point that, yeah, this is the reason for why we have poor AI. And no, it's, it's much bigger picture. Yuri, and uh, uh, I guess I'm oversimplifying a little bit, uh, but to, to bring it a more to like an everyday example, um, I don't know, would it be fair to compare this a little bit to cooking? I don't know, yes. maybe I'm hungry or <laughs> yes. if I'm the um, world's best chef and I only have really bad ingredients, you yeah. know? Uh, uh, you're absolutely right. This is a very good example. No matter how skilled you are uh, as a chef, uh, um, it will be very difficult for you to keep, to cook something with um, poor ingredients. And um, yeah, you're, 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 you're spot on. I have another example. Um, so as it was happened in the, as it happened in the past, uh, it's from the uh, healthcare, from medical research, the root cause analysis of what was causing the ulcers, the you know, the medical condition oh. in the stomach. So, and for years, the perceived reason for that was that it's stress that is causing it. So when you analyze, even like, imagine that you are analyzing uh, the data set and every patient with ulcer has stress. So if you only have that data, probably yes, you will, and machine learning model will tell you that stress is the reason it caused the ulcer. But uh, we know now that it's bacteria that is causing it. So the stress in that equation, it was not the um, uh, the cause. It was just a correlation, and that's a mismatch. Oh wow, that is a serious mismatch too, Yuri. That's yes, health. and yeah, yeah, uh, it is. It is important to have complete data. And this is, you see, this is a real world evidence of why we need to pay attention to data quality. So how are companies making sure that their data is actually up to the task today? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So we, aside from having a technology to handle the data, yes, you think about the methodology, the data management practices, and you integrate all the checks and controls that will just in, enforce the good data quality. We talk about introducing a framework of data stewardship, the uh, data mesh, data ownership, data as a product. It's when you have stakeholders, you have uh, subject matter experts in your team who understand the data. It's nature who have who see something beyond just you know tables and namespaces in a database. Someone who understands the nature of the data, and it, this is very important because. Um, uh, you know, the person who is very good with models, with wrangling the data and with crunching the data sets might not be the best person to understand the, the business, what it means for the business to have this data, what it means to, how to interpret, uh, you know, how to make an interpretation from an insight that machine learning model is producing. That's why we need data stewardship. That's why we need SMEs to actually work side by side with data scientists. Um, and one of the examples that I was thinking about is if you look at the ad tech, um, you have parents, teachers, and students. If you get all of them together in one table as just users of your online LMS, if you then start crunching that data set, you will be comparing people who are who should not be compared to each other. And that's why the person who understands the nature of the data and says that, all right, this adult is a parent. It's, it should not be treated in the same way as a teacher or as a facilitator or as you know supervisor. That person can actually divide the data set in the more granular and appropriate uh, buckets. Oh, so that's actually a bit surprising for me to hear because since it's all about the tech lately. That's all we think about. Uh, I almost forgot that we also might need people still. And that's yep. exactly the case, right? This is what you call data stewardship. And yep. that means it's not just about the big database 
and the technology side of it, it's actually very important to have the people there who know what the data really means. Yes, it, it is super important because it's, you see, it's not another system that is consuming, uh, you, you know, using your product, you're doing something for people at the end of the day. Um, and yeah, even if you are in a B2B, there will be end consumers who will appreciate everything that you're doing. That's why SME's in, uh, involvement is, is very important. And decisions that AI is making is, uh, yeah, sometimes it affects real people. So that's why people need to be involved in the decision making too. Oh, that's so interesting. Yuri, I'm, I'm really curious to, to know maybe one more example that I can apply to my own life. So I keep thinking of how this affects me, let's say, for instance, I use Google Maps a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So can you um, draw yes, the yes, line yes. there? Mm -hmm. So you are in an EV car, right? And you want to charge it now. And um, you point to the next charger and it, uh, your map tells you how to drive there. And technically, uh, you know that there are different highways and certain highways there, there is a middle uh, lane that you cannot cross. It can be a physical barrier. So imagine the situation when you arrive to the EV charger place on the map, but you realize that the station is on the other side of the highway. Um, so to get there, you have to actually make another, you know, U-turn and, and it can be in some cases uh, a lengthy journey. But yeah, you need to, you need, you expect this from your map to actually understand the rules of how to navigate on a highway and what it means to make a left turn here or right turn there and to understand where the things and businesses are located aside from just having roads in your memory. Ah, and this is where the people come in. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is where the people can come in because uh, someone need to explain the set this rule that you cannot make this turn here. <laughs> okay, now I get it a bit better, actually. Um, you did mention um, right at the beginning um, how important uh, the bias is and the context, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about that, because I hear yeah. a lot of a lot of people talk about bias in AI and how are, how are companies addressing that today? How important is it? Yeah. So I want to start by saying that it's, um, things changed. It's not the companies that are primarily concerned with it. It's the regulation that is concerned with it. So okay. here in the U S we can see that different states are adopting the regulation. There are new bills coming. There are new acts coming that regulate how you use AI in decision-making things about hiring or firing people, things about, for example, issuing a driver license or uh, benefits distribution, you must record what you are collecting, the data that you are collecting. You must get the consent from the person. And you also have to make sure that the model is and the process is auditable and you have to report what data you have collected and what decision was made because Nobody wants to automate discrimination. Nobody wants to make this an, an, a new normality when AI just discriminates left and right because of the data that was used to train this model. So, and as an example, as I, I already mentioned, for example, um, things that stem from individual characteristics, decisions made around like, because of people's age or gender or race or or whether people, uh, a certain individual, um, she or he has children or what, what, what about job, what about income? All of this um, needs to be taken very carefully because certain data parameters, data fields cannot be used for making decisions. Otherwise it will be perceived as discrimination. And it will be difficult to, you know, defend the model because uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tough problem to develop explainable AI that will actually explain why it was doing certain things. Now, there is another example. Um, nowadays, we talk about Gen AI and bias by definition is disproportion, disproportionate weight in, of something in decision-making. 
it's when you are disproportionately in favor or against of something because of unrelated things. So with Gen AI, and uh, I, uh, one of our colleagues pointed this out to me, is that uh, there is the verb to delve, delve into something. And it is less used in the US and in the UK in the business language, and it is more used in different countries in other parts of the world. So because of probably because of re reinforced learning, that word was introduced and statistically is much higher. Uh, it is much higher to see this word in text produced with Gen AI with certain models, um, which the bottom line of this is the bias, in the source in the ways how you train model in the text that you use to train the model will result into the way what content the model generates. And then users will actually see that bias. For example, the same word to Delph. Uh, um, if you read an article that has to Delph in its title, you may think now that it was generated with Gen AI. Wow, because you understand that's... this bias, because it was trained on a certain language in a certain way, in a certain, you know, by, 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 by certain methods. You now see, oh, this text has this bias. It was generated this way. Yuri, this is such a good example because it makes me realize that I use that word a lot. Mm, <laughs> and I, interesting. I, yeah, so I might stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, that, that's really, really good to know. Uh, Yuri, I wonder, since we're still here in the present, I wonder if you have, let's say, an unpopular opinion about data in AI. Something that is happening right now that might may qualify as an unpopular opinion of your own yeah um i think that models will be better and better and every other week there will be a new breakthrough with with ai but will it actually solve the problem will it actually do what people want it to do we don't know so instead of actually focusing on new great things on the market in AI, I would actually focus on what it should do. And instead of opting, you know, for more data to be shared with AI, for new models to be integrated, I would actually stick to the basics and think about the, the product concepts, the way how you want to develop certain things and limit the data that you want to be exposed to AI to be more disciplined around this, um, to have more controls. Because you just you don't want to just throw a lot of good stuff in a can and assume that something good will happen. You need to think about this and, and own and control this process. So quality over quantity. Well, yeah, again, yes, quality is much more important. Right. This and also I wanna I wanna have a whole list of all the words that I should avoid, but we'll oh, yeah. talk about it somewhere <laughs> another time. Uh, Yuri, this brings me to uh, potentially my favorite part, which is predicting the future. So where are we going with all of this? So wh where do you think AI and data quality is heading? What challenges are we going to face more and more as AI is becoming more advanced? Just some thoughts that you might have. Yeah, I, I, I had one thing in my mind is about um, the concept of actionable AI is when uh, you can not only just read and, uh, you know, make AI write or summarize something for you when you can actually, uh, an engine that has such a good quality and when hallucinations and all of these things are by design excluded from its functionality, like it cannot hallucinate. It is very prescriptive in certain ways that you can actually work with this AI assistant to actually do something, book a trip, um, schedule an appointment, even with the system that that AI engine never worked with. Imagine that you found a new you know, um, movie theater, you know, and you want to, uh, you know, go and watch that film. You ask your AI assistant to book that, uh, you know, to buy a ticket for you. And although that AI engine never worked with that provider never worked with that website it will figure out how to do it and you will receive a confirmation email in your inbox 
So the actionable AI is that you can actually trust that it will not hallucinate in the middle and that it will actually do something that you want for the money that you pay um, in the right place in the right time. You know, th this is something that we need to be looking forward to. Mm -hmm. And how realistic is this to get it right? What do you think? Well, it's tough. It, um, and now we are getting closer to it by means of identity AIs and introducing, you know, guardrails and whatnot and building hybrids between gen AI and conventional models and, you know, workflow automation. We're getting closer to it. But the technology, yeah, I, I, I keep hearing that technology is not there right now for complex cases. So probably, yeah, there needs to be another round of innovation. Mm -hmm. And anything else, like in terms of the challenges around data quality itself? That yes, um, um, what is missing is the data entitlement, data um, built-in data security. Is when every field, every column, ev everything is annotated and classified automatically, and models understand that and. This is from the data quality perspective, data privacy perspective. The, I, I, to me, there is a gap that um, you have to superficially orchestrate that. Instead, it should be built in into products or platforms. And models should be absolutely um, respective of that data entitlement and that mechanism because we all want to break silos in data. But by breaking silos, we should not create new, more complex problems, accidentally leaking data or providing access to certain. So that data entitlement, I think, is from the data quality standpoint, is um, it's a new opportunity. I see. Yuri, you know, I really want to leave our listeners uh, on this wrap-up question. Uh, I'm curious, is there something on the horizon of AI and data right now that you personally Yuri Gubin, are following or are excited about? It's a very good question. Um, again, I, I spend a lot of time thinking and reading and researching the actionable AI the use cases. So that's, yeah, back back to this. So um, this is on my mind now. It's how to remove all the hallucinations and uh, make it predictable and can we do this right now with models that we have, Gen AI or not? Um, yeah, this is something that I'm, I'm I'm very curious about. Okay, I hope we we talk about this again next year, and you will tell us. Yeah, a bit more. <laughs> um, this has been really such an insightful chat, Yuri. Thank you so much. We have covered the importance of data quality. We have touched upon where we are now, where we're going. Uh, I really loved your examples. I will remember garbage in, garbage out, quality over quantity, and pay attention to the words that you choose because yep. they might they might point to something. Yeah. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. It's exciting times for sure, and thank you for helping us make sense of all of that today. Mm -hmm. Thank you for um, inviting. Thank you for the time. And thank you so much to our listeners for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, do not forget to subscribe, like, share. And as always, we always want to hear from you. Any thoughts, questions, insights, opinions of your own, do reach out to us at biztechpower.dataart.com. And that's all for now. Take care and see you next time. Thanks for listening to BizTech Forward. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast to stay updated on the latest in business and technology. Join us next time for more insights and forward-thinking discussions. Presented by DataArt.